Sprite. Welcome to CS4510. Uh, this is, in my opinion, the hardest proof in the entire class, and we do a lot of stuff. So that we're, we'll prove every uh, PDA as a CFG. This is, I think, a very difficult proof, but it's also very creative. That's, you need to like see one, at least one hard proof in this class just to have respect for the reason that we are skipping a lot of the proofs. Um, last time we proved that every CFG has a PDA because we were able to program a PDA to simulate the productions of the CFG. And that's kind of easy because a PDA is more like a program and you know how to write code, so we could like write code that simulated a, that the, the grammar. So we basically read, wrote a PDA to evaluate the grammar for us. And that was kind of easy. But uh, none of you should have any knowledge on how to program a CFG. What does that even mean, program a CFG? So this proof, the construction is, first of all, non-trivial. It's much more difficult. And second of all, we didn't actually prove the correctness last time, that the CF, exactly the strings that the CFG produces are exactly those the PDA accepts. Here, we will do the full proof of correctness. It's going to require a if and only if, which will prove through two implications, each of which will be proved using a proof by induction, and then each proof <coughs> will also have two cases. So the proof is going to take the majority of the class, but the intuition is very easy. But I just want you to see what the proof looks like, and to have the humility and thankfulness that we will not be doing a lot of the simulation proofs in, in this class. You know, Even technically, we didn't prove that the power set construction of the NFA uh, is equivalent to the DFA, although you should, it was obviously correct. For you to formalize, that would be a little difficult. Uh, here we'll do, we'll do, we'll, we'll do the, the, the true formalization. So uh, before we proceed, we'll, do, we'll modify the PDA. We'll, so given a PDA P, we want to show that there exists a CFGG such that the languages that are accepted by the PDAs are exactly those produced by these grammars. Um, this is the second half, by the way, of the uh, double set containment. Last time we proved that every language that is generated by a context-free grammar is also accepted by a PDA. Today we're going to prove that every language that is accepted by a PDA has an equivalent context-free grammar. And by double set containment, these, are, these two are equal. Programming a CFG is actually somewhat difficult. Again, the PDA reads left to right, and it pops and pushes from the stack. How does a grammar produce? A grammar produces inside out. When you have something like S goes to A, S, B, uh, notice that the last symbol and the first symbol are done uh, first, right? So in some sense, the first and last symbol are determined before intermediary symbols. So although a PDA may read left to right, a grammar may construct the the letters in almost any order that it wants. And that's sort of different and alien to us uh, for, to, make it, to make a CF, uh, to translate those things together. So we're going to first make the PDA quote unquote nice, and that'll help us with the grammar. Uh, so we're gonna, uh, let uh, P be a PDA, any PDA. We give a CFG a G. Uh, such that uh, the language accepted by the PDA is exactly that which is produced by the grammar. We'll make P nice in three ways. First, first, we make P nice. First, uh, three modifications to the PDA. One, uh, only one accept state. If I wanted to modify the PDA so that it only had one accept state, what should I do? Uh, take all the existing accept states and add just an epsilon transition to the <coughs> new accept state, and then all the old ones stop being accept states. This trick also works for NFAs, if you want to have NFAs of one accept state. Um, great. Two, 
Um, we want to accept only with an empty stack. How would I modify the PDA to accept only when the stack is empty? It begins with an empty stack. We want it to end with an empty stack. Like at the end. Sorry. Oh, we're gonna say like at the end, just pop everything, and then add a new state that's the accept state once everything's popped. That's one way, and that's probably the better way. But the way I'm going to explain it is that we make sure we do the canary thing. We make sure that we only accept if the stack was empty. So we pop nothing, push the dollar sign if we aren't already, and then we make sure we pop the dollar sign to accept. Right? And this can be anything going on. But as you said, would also work just like dump the stack and then accept. That would also work. Um, three, this one's a little bit tricky. Uh, each transition pops or pushes, but not both. How would we make a PDA do that? A middle state where like you pop and then push or vice versa. Say you read A, pop B, push C. What you do is you read A, pop B, push nothing, then you just push C. Right. In practice, if you notice, those two are equivalent, right? It takes an extra step, but you pop, and then you push. Uh, in practice, if you think about it, every PDA we gave already had these properties. We only the useful PDAs are the ones that only accepted with the dollar sign at the end. Um, if you think about it, there was very rare cases that we popped and pushed on the same transition. If you pop and push on the same transition, you're just swapping the top of the stack. How useful is that? The only time we did that was to peak. Uh, and then here in practice, they always had one accept state anyway. So this is what we are going to we can by assuming the PDA has these properties, um, then uh, you know things will be nice. Right. It will, it'll help us in constructing the grammar, right? So let's just get into how we could construct the grammar for this. There are two cases during a computation of a PDA, right? If we accept only with an empty stack, we start only with an empty stack, then we start and accept only with an empty stack. There are two cases. Case one is the stack is emptied at some point. So this is stack is emptied. And then stack is not. Something like this, okay? And this graph represents the stack height. Now it should be staggered, okay? But it's not, and it's definitely not continuous. It should really look more like this, right? Something like this. It doesn't really matter. But like Minecraft the graph, right? Um, if the stack is emptied at some point, consider the computation specifically from some state uh, p to q for both of these cases. All right? If you, uh, if the stack is not emptied from p to q, uh, let's, say, let's say the stack is emptied uh, from p to q at some point r. Then there is a string that'll take us from state p to state q. It is simply the concatenation of the strings that'll take us from state p to state r and from state r to state q. So that's basically the structure of the grammar. Uh, for all uh, p comma q in q, add non-terminal a p q, such that a p q produces a string uh, x, uh, if and only if, x brings the PDA p from uh, p uh, with empty stack to q 
with empty stack. And I will shorten this notation later. But we want x to be a string that brings p, the PDA, from state p to state q, from starting with an empty stack from state p and ending on an empty stack with state q. Now, what is the start state going to be of our grammar? I have a question. So when we say that, like, there exists a string that brings the PDA from yeah. state p to q with an empty stack, does that mean, like, what, there exists some computation path on input x that goes from state p to state q? x is the symbols read off the input. So like if you were to instantiate the machine beginning at state p, mm -hmm. x would bring the machine to go to state q. Maybe it pushes and pops a bunch of symbols on the way. But x is a string that'll take it from p to q. Okay. It's a little more complicated than, than the way we have a DFA where we say x is a path in the graph. Yeah. Because it basically is, but now there's some popping and pushing going on. right? Um, what should the start state of the uh, grammar be? We want the grammar to only produce strings that the PDA accepts. And a PDA will accept a string if that string takes it from the start state to any accepting state, right? So we'll, and we only have one accepting state, so we'll say A should go, we should start with some non-terminal A0, F, where this is uh, from Q0 to QF. QF is, let's suppose, our only accepting state, right? So whatever strings that A0, F produces are the strings that the PDA exactly accepts, right? Let's go to our two cases. We have, the stack is emptied at some point from AP at some point R. So that means you are popping something when you enter R and then pushing something when you leave R from the computation from P to Q. What kind of production should we add for A, P, Q? Given case one, consider the computation of the stack is emptied at some point. Now, we're, we'll prove this above statement where A, P, Q produces a string X if and only if X brings the PDA from P with an empty stack to Q with an empty stack. But we first want to think about what the grammar should have, right? If you go from P to Q, empty stack to empty stack, consider case one where the stack is emptied at some point. How would you define this recursively in terms of other non-terminals? Perfect. ARQ, APR, will, is a non-terminal to produce some string that takes you from P to R. ARQ is some non-terminal that'll produce strings that take you from R to Q. So if you concatenate a string that'll take you from P to R and R to Q, that'll take you from P to Q, right? This is true only if the st stack is emptied at some point R. Um, what about this case? Now this case is a little harder. Um, if the stack, and again, you can, if its stack is emptied several times, you can recursively divide that back down to a case that looks like this. If the stack is never emptied, consider this case two, the stack is never emptied from P to Q. Then you actually know something. You know that some symbol, the, the first symbol that was pushed was also the last symbol that was popped. So you know when you left P, you pushed some U, and when you popped P from, when you entered Q, you popped from some U. You enter Q with an empty stack by assumption. That symbol that you popped was in there during the whole computation. So the structure looks like this. You read some A, uh, pop nothing, push some symbol U. You're at some state R. Then from some state S, you go to you enter state Q by reading, let's say, Z. You pop this final U, and then you push nothing. So you leave P with an empty stack, by, and you push U to the stack. Then you perform some computation that gets you to state S, and then finally from state S, whatever S is, you read Z off the input, and then you pop finally that U during the computation. Let me like this, right? Whatever the possible paths are in the uh, thing. If we're in case two and the stack is not emptied at some point, what should our productions be? This is hard, I think, yeah. You need 
it's like all the letters that you never like push at some point. So like almost if you think about all the letters that are going up, up until the peak. Does that make so sense? This two, there's two things going on here. This is the stack. This is a kind of a confusing graph because this is the stack height. But we want to produce words in the input. And in, in that sense, those are words that take you from state to state. But the stack height is growing and changing. So it's not the stack where we want to produce strings of, we want to produce the input. Right? I think this is a tricky one, but let's see if we can think about this for another second. I don't know how to phrase this better, but I feel like you could cut off part of our, yeah, something like that, and then you could get to a state where you do reach a quote-unquote emptied stack if you just ignore that bottom part of the stack? The whole proof is, I don't know how to word this well. The whole proof will look like that. So I'll have to do a lot of not hand-waving, but over-explaining. If you go, you let, leave p with an empty stack, and then you enter r with only a u in the stack, some computation occurs. By the time you hit s, you only have a u in the stack, and then you finally pop that off. That means in the computation from r to s, you perform the whole computation with this u in the stack, but it was never touched. That u was just sitting in the stack ignored. It was never popped off. Otherwise, it would have been empty at some point, right? The u was never popped out. So you know that u was never popped out. Now, if you can go from r to s with just u in the stack ignored, whatever string will take you from r to s with just u in the stack ignored, that string will also take you from r to s with an empty stack to an empty stack. So we know that the production from p to q with just u in the stack is somehow a function of the productions from r to s with just, with just u in the stack. Right? What, what is the non-terminal to take you to produce strings that take you from r to s? It's going to be ars. Now this is almost done. What are we missing? Yes, and what is the symbols that come before and after? Um, the symbols that you took, uh, that you, whenever you pop push or pop something. Exactly. So that's going to be, just as I've written the diagram, we'll call the first symbol A. We'll call the last symbol Z. Where A is whatever was read first when you push that U, and Z is whatever was read last when you push that U. These are our productions. There's one more production we need. For all p, we have a, p, p produces what? Epsilon. Epsilon. The empty string will always take you from every state to every state. Right. Uh, let me give you, this is the high level idea. Let me give you the actual just formal definition. Right? So we say uh, for p is some PDA, let's say q, uh, sigma, Q sigma uh, gamma uh, Q zero uh, delta and then F, but F is just equal to the set of QF. Right, there's just one final state for us. We will let, um, for all PQ in Q, add uh, non-terminal APQ to uh, V. So we're defining a grammar in terms of a PDA. So given a generic PDA with our three nice conditions, we'll define, we'll define a grammar in a, in a certain way. Then we can add S goes to uh, A0F, or in fact, we could have just said F is 0F. S is 0F, doesn't particularly matter. And then um, for all P that are states, add production, APP goes to epsilon. The empty string will always bring a PDA from state p to state p. We'll need this as a base case in our inductions. Um, and for all p, q, r in q, you add production a, p, q goes to a, p, r, a, r, q. Okay. Then for all uh, p, q, r, s in q, uh, u is an element of gamma. Uh, and then A and Z are elements of sigma or the empty string. We add production A, P, Q goes to A, 
A R S Z. Oh, I need to change that. A goes to A R S Z. I'll add this production only if uh, P read A, pop nothing, push U, R S read Z, pop nothing, excuse me, pop this U, push nothing, say Q. If this structure exists in, exists in the PDA. Right. So you go look at the PDA and you go, oh, does this structure exist? And I add these uh, things. Few observations we can make immediately. First is that the construction is much, much harder than given a CFG, we turn into a PDA. That's kind of easy because we were able to literally just give a grammar and come up with some examples. I don't want to even come up with a grammar, come up with, given a PDA, actually write down an example grammar because I'm already overwhelmed. Um, but what we're going to do is just prove the correctness of this so we don't have to come up with examples. Yes? Case we have all PQs and R's. Is that just any three states? Yeah, it turns out that it's okay because uh, we don't have to condition on that on the fact that the, if there even is a computation path from uh, P to R to Q, because then you would have to like somehow algorithm, algorithmically explore on the PDA to see if there is a computation path at all that can reach from P to R, empty stack, empty stack, and R to Q, empty stack, empty stack. And that is like a much harder question. But it turns out if you just add it for all, it's fine. Because whatever strings, it, it by correctness, it may produce no strings. There may not be a string. But that's fine, because then that non-terminal won't produce those strings. Honeydew doesn't produce like, any more strings though, that you don't want. Ah, we will pro when we prove the correctness, the statement we will prove the correctness of is this one right here. Uh, APQ, and then this implies with the star above it, means produces in zero or more productions. We say APQ will produce a string X if and only if X brings the PDA P from P with the empty stack to Q with the empty stack. That's what we'll prove, and we'll prove this if and only if, and we'll prove it both ways. The reason you need to do it as an if and only if is suppose I made a grammar that only produced sigma star. Then if the PDA accepted the word, the grammar would, ex if the PDA accepts the word, the grammar certainly produces the word. That's too trivial. It has to be an if and only if. So we will also prove that there won't be a string produced by the grammar that the PDA didn't accept. That's when th that'll be taken care of when we prove the if and only if. Right. But for now, this is simply the construction. This is the grammar itself. Any questions on that one? The correctness should follow in just a second when we do this proof. All right. Now, again, like I said, this proof is uh, kind of cool, but a little tedious. We're going to do a proof, and we're going to do an if and only if proof, and we'll do so by double induction. Let's see. We will prove that APQ as a non-terminal produces a string X, not a working string, a string X in uh, zero or more productions. This non-terminal produces this string if and only if uh, X brings P from state P. And I'll use this notation P E S as in empty stack to Q empty stack. So not only does X bring the PDA P from state P to Q, but it does so if you begin with P with an empty stack and you end on Q with an empty stack. That's what that notation means. So we want to prove that, convince yourself that this is the correctness of the grammar. APQ produces a string X if and only if F X brings P from P to Q, empty stack to empty stack. Then A0F certainly should produce all strings that begin at the start state and end in the accept state. So A0 will produce all strings that the PDA accepts. So the grammar produces all strings that the PDA accepts. Exactly and only all strings that the PDA accepts. Also, because it's an if and only if, right? Let's proceed with the proof. Any questions on just the high level proof outline, why this shows the correctness before we do the proof? 
All right, let's do the forward way. Every implication, every biconditional must be proven if and only if, and then only if. So we assume, uh, I'll do it this way. We proceed by induction, strong induction, in fact, on the number of productions. Right? So assume that APQ uh, uh, produces some st string x. Want to show that whatever string this non-terminal produces, x brings p from empty stack to q. Uh, from brings, brings p from state p, p empty stack to q empty stack. Uh, we proceed by induction on the number of productions. So suppose APQ, uh, we'll do the base case first. A, APQ produces uh, some string x in zero productions. Not, excuse me, not zero productions, in one production. So consider we perform induction on the number of productions, the, the length of the derivation, right? You apply a production, you apply a production, you apply a production, you apply a production. You're out of non-terminals, so the productions stop. Now, x is not a working string. It doesn't contain any non-terminals. It must only contain terminals. So there is exactly one rule here of us that the right-hand side of the rules that were allowed has only terminals. Right? Which one is it? Yes. That's the only one where the right-hand side has no non-terminals on it. So that's the only one in a single step will produce a string. So x must equal the empty string. And uh, p equals q. So APP does produce the empty string in one step. And epsilon definitely brings uh, p from p empty stack to p empty stack. The induction hypothesis is going to be what? Assume that if APQ produces some string x in uh, less than equal to k productions, that x brings p from p empty stack to q empty stack, OK? So assume by the strong induction, by strong induction, that every non-terminal, every uh, applica applications of up to k productions uh, produces a string x, whatever string is produced in at most k productions, that is also a string that will bring the PDA from P to Q empty stack to empty stack. Consider then um, uh, APQ producing a string x in uh, k plus one production in k plus one productions. So we're going to assume that x is done in k plus 1 productions, we want to show, uh, want to show x brings p from p empty stack to q empty stack. That's what we'll show in just a second. OK, so when you have a sequence of productions, uh, you have k plus 1 productions, OK? There is some first production, right? So we have two cases. Case one, first production is like APQ produces APR, uh, ARQ, right? Suppose there is some first production. Suppose the first production is the one of this type, where it's concatenation of two non-terminals. Um, By strong induction, uh, 
uh, APR uh, produces some string, let's say Y, in less than equal to K productions. Uh, and uh, y brings a p uh, from p empty stack to r empty stack. Similarly, apr, excuse me, arq produces a string uh, z uh, such that z brings pdap from P, excuse me, R empty stack to Q empty stack. Uh, with uh, X is equal to the concatenation of Y and Z, right? So then we know that APQ produces uh, in a single step a, P, R, A, R, Q, which produces the string uh, Y, uh, Z, uh, which is equal to some X. Since uh, Y brings a P from P empty stack to R empty stack, uh, Z brings P, uh, P, from R empty stack to S, empty, excuse me, Q empty stack, empty stack. X, which is equal to Y, Z, brings uh, P from P empty stack to Q empty stack, as desired for case one. Okay. Case two, first production. is uh, of the second kind, APQ goes to AARSZ. Okay? By the strong induction hypothesis, ARS produces some string, let's say Y, in less than or equal to K productions. So, uh, y, by the induction hypothesis, brings P from uh, R empty stack to S empty stack. Since we only add productions, since that rule was only added uh, when we saw this structure, since, I'll, I'll, I'll write it, I'll draw it again, P, uh, read an A, Pop nothing, push a U, R, read an S, read a Z, uh, excuse me, at state C, at state S, read a Z, pop the U, push nothing, and end on state Q. Since we only added uh, that production when that structure exists in the graph, um, Y takes... Uh, P from P, not empty stack, excuse me, not P, uh, R empty, not empty stack, but R just U to S just U. Right? So P is a, excuse me, Y is a string that'll take the PDA from state R to state S, not just from empty stack to empty stack, but from just U. R with just a U in the stack to S with just a U in the stack. If Y is such a string that'll take uh, the PDA from R to S with just U in the stack, and we know we can enter R by pushing a U, and we can leave R by popping a U, then AYZ is equal to X must bring P from uh, P empty stack to R, a uh, Q empty stack. Okay. Questions on that first half of the proof? We're halfway done.
<laughs> so, uh, we performed induction again on the length of the computation, on the length of the derivation. Uh, you can see by strong induction, you got the fact that these recursive rules worked out for us. As, when you have anything recursive, by the way, historically, the words induction and recursion used to mean the same thing. So given any recursive construction, you, won't, you probably should try proof by induction. Induction gives, it gives us that P, APR, and ARQ are correct. So the concatenation, we, only, we need to only show when they're concatenated is correct. Um, Questions on this one? Okay. Let me put it on that board. We'll do the second. So that was the if proof. Let's do the only if proof. Okay, we want to show the only if direction, which is that uh, if if x uh, we'll say a let x bring p from p empty stack to q empty stack. And From P empty stack to Q empty stack, we want to prove that APQ as a non terminal produces in some number of productions this string X. That's the proof of the reverse direction, right? Uh, we're going to proceed by induction. Induction on what? Last time we proceeded by induction on the number of productions. Induction on productions. What should we proceed by induction on? The length of x. The length of x. Ah. In a grammar, though, a gr more than one letter could be added. And actually, that might actually be OK. You could do like strong induction, and then you need like a, two, like a minus 2 case and a minus 1 case. Like a Cauchy induction or something weird. Yeah. There's a simpler proof, though. We did that one. We did induction on the productions of grammars. We're going to let x be defined correctly for the PDA and show that the grammar must correctly produce it. Before, we said the non-terminal correctly produces it, and we did induction on the number of productions of the grammar. Here, we're going to proceed by induction on what? Is it the number of states? In the number of states of the PDA? No, that's also not true. The number of states, is there another name? Is the number of states visited during the computation? Well, there's another name for that. What if, could you count a self loop as two, two distinct states? OK, well, you should. We proceed, the reason I'm emphasizing this is that computation is a process. It's always a procedure in some sense, and it's never simply functional. It's never simply input-output matched. The grammar is a computation because it, it is a substring additively replacement program as, like it, as a sequence of productions. Um, the PDA, is, as well, takes a sequence of steps. So the induction on the number of productions, analogously, in the reverse way, should correspond to induction on the number of computation steps, the number of steps the PDA will take. On the man, maybe I'm just picking on the number of steps of the PDA computation. Right? So, base case, base back then we had a base case of one because to produce a string, you had to apply one production. That was the base case on the number of productions because the start non-terminal, zero productions, you just end on the start non-terminal, right? Uh, what is the smallest compute, the number, the fewest number of steps of a PDA that will accept a string? None. None. 
So it's actually, although the base case for the number of productions was 1, our base case for the number of computations after the PD will be 0. Consider computations of 0 steps. We don't have, there's no time to change state. So consider productions that are of the form APP goes to some x for whatever the string x is. You don't have time to change the state. So computations of zero productions of the PDA should correspond exactly to strings produced by the non-terminal APP. Now, if you have no production, if you have no t computation time, you can't take any steps to change state, you also don't have any time to read the input. Also, no time to read input. So whatever string is produced could only be the empty string, right? Uh, but we have non-terminal, uh, we have production APP goes to the empty string as desired. So that's correct. Man. I brought six markers to class. You'd think they would all work. Um, uh, induction hypothesis. Um, let, uh, let x bring, bring p from a uh, p empty stack to q empty stack in less than or equal to k uh, productions. Uh, if, excuse me, if x brings p from p empty stack to q empty stack in less than or equal to k productions, uh, then uh, APQ produces this string uh, X, okay? If the production takes less than K steps, the non-terminal also produces that string. Um, let X be, uh, let X be some string that brings uh, PDAP from P empty stack to Q empty stack in k plus 1 uh, steps. Oh, production's here. Steps. Sorry. In k plus 1 steps. Uh, we want to show that, uh, want to show that APQ must still produce the string x. Okay. So if x brings p, the PDA, from state p to state q, empty stack to empty stack, there's two cases. Uh, case one, stack is emptied at some point. At some, let's say, let's say state R. Okay. Uh, then X is equal to, let's say, UV. Well, let's not say UV. Let's say, uh, v w uh, v brings p uh, from a p from p empty stack to q empty stack excuse me from p to r empty stack to empty stack uh, w brings p from R empty stack to Q empty stack. Okay? If there is, the stack is emptied at some point, then partition the string into two pieces such that the prefix of the string brings the PDA from that state P to that state R, and then W brings that PDA from that state R to some state Q, whatever that, whatever that R happens to be. By the induction hypothesis, um, APQ, APR, excuse me, produces 
some string that whatever that string is v and a rq produces uh, the string v the string excuse me the string w notice we added production APQ goes to APR, ARQ. So we have APQ in one production will go <coughs> APR, ARQ, and then in a sequence of productions, each of those by the induction hypothesis will produce V and will produce W, which is just equal to X. So APQ produces the string x as desired. Questions in that case? Again, beautiful use of the induction hypothesis. Uh, delegate to the problem already being solved. The computation from p to r takes fewer steps. Just apply the induction hypothesis. Show that the concatenations of those two computations takes you uh, to where you want to go. Questions on that? We have one more case to go. Case two, stack is never emptied. So last symbol pushed, say, u is first, excuse me, first symbol pushed is last symbol popped. The stack is never emptied at some point. The first symbol pushed. Again, this u is equivalent to the last symbol popped, this u. Right? Uh, so uh, x is equal to some a, y, z, where y brings the PDA p, p from uh, some R, uh, empty stack, not empty stack, but just U, to uh, S, just U. But if R is a string that can bring the PDA from R with just U to S with just U, uh, then Y can bring P from R empty stack to S empty stack. By the strong induction, that takes less than K computation steps. So uh, APARS, excuse me, must produce this string Y. Right? And here, X equals AYZ uh, because we have, again, the structure like this. You read an A, uh, pop nothing, push U, and you read the Z, pop the U, push nothing. Right? If ARS produces uh, some substring Y, and we broke up X into A, Y, Z, where A was the symbol read when we pushed the U, and Z was the symbol read when we popped the U, uh, and ARS produces Y, we only broke X up this way for the same reason that we only added this production is when those uh, states existed. So, um, APQ uh, produces this string, uh, A, A, R, S, Z, because we had that production. So let's see, even one, one step because we had that production. But then in a sequence of steps, that'll produce a, y, z, which as defined is in just equal to x. So a, p, q in some number of computation steps and some number of productions produces some string x as desired. So case two is also handled. Whew. 
Any questions on that proof? Yes? When we create a grammar, it's like it's non-deterministic, right? Because we could have like APQ go to the, like the first case or the second case depending on how it's constructed, right? This case or this case? Like, could we have, um, so like every pair of states creates like a terminal, right? Correct. So can we have like APQ goes to some PRQ, but it also could possibly go to some like ARSQ? Um, yeah. And it turns out that the non-deterministic choices of the grammar ex are exactly what's going to simulate the non-deterministic computations of the PDA. Consider all computations from P to Q. Some don't empty the stack at all. Some maybe empty the stack three times. For whatever choice of computation path there is, there will be a selection of grammars that will lead you to the same strings. Right? So like, if there's a computation from P to Q that empties the st stack three times, then you can take this production three times or two times. And then similarly, if there is no computation, you can take this. And whatever combination. Whatever non-deterministic choices that the uh, PDA can make, the grammar exactly simulates those non-deterministic choices by choosing when, to, when it decides if the computation path empties the stack or not. Right? One more thing I want to over-explain about this proof is the fact that the, even though the PDA produces left to right and the grammar produces inside out, we simulate that perfectly with the grammar by looking at the last symbol read by the PDA instead of the next symbol read, the next symbol read, the next symbol read. We, d we produce inside out as a grammar should. We produce the first symbol to be the first symbol that the PDA read, and then we produce the last symbol to be the last symbol the PDA read. So the computation is like inverted in some sense. It's like when you take a donut and you do that to it. You know, it's like an inside out donut kind of thing going on compared to all the other weird structures we have. This is half the proof, by the way. This is the proof that every PDA has a CFG. We didn't actually prove that every CFG has a PDA, but the proof would also be by a double induction. Every proof would have such four parts. The proof of the regular grammars are exactly those decided by interface, would also have four parts. We only did two parts today, but each two parts had two cases and so on. So you can see these proofs get quite tedious and quite long. Right? Any questions on the, on the content of the proof? So like, we like semantically like an English defined that will like take this transition APQ to or, like the production to APR, ARQ if and only if R is like another point that is empty in the middle of the computation path. And like that's implicitly enforced by the fact that we'll eventually run into a point where we can't do other things if we take that computation too many times and we'll run into a state where we can't take the other one, the AI, like little a, big A, R, S, Z. And then on the flip side, if we don't take it enough times, then we'll run into a situation where like the stack goes negative. Mm -hmm. And so we could have situations where we like don't have that balance. Uh, of there's no negative stack, but yeah. Yeah. So think of this case is always going to delegate to cases that look like this. Yeah. Right? You break this, cup, this case up enough at the high level, you'll always end up with a case like this, right? Now consider, for example, not only consider like P and R to be any two states that there does not even exist a path between them. There is no path from P to R. Suppose that to be true. <coughs> then when you delegate the productions to look like this, you're not going to have any productions. You'll just have, you won't ever have APR on the left-hand side because you'll never have something like this to look at. So you'll have like, suppose you have Q0 to Q1 to Q2. And let's say you have Q2 to Q0 is equal to Q2 to Q1 to Q0, which can never happen. There will never be a Q2 to Q1 goes to something because this doesn't exist in that PDA. Yeah. So it's over redundant, and you'll even perhaps even add non terminals that don't aren't needed, but it's fine. I see. And then if we were to just repeatedly apply the ladder transition over and over again too many times, then we would basically dead end nowhere because we would like hit. Um, like an R and an S in the middle. Okay. Where we can't apply that transition again, maybe because we no longer have the structure where we push you and pop you at the end. Because at some point in the computation path that we were previously utilizing to repeatedly apply that transition, now it dipped below. Like at some point in the computation, the stack dipped below zero, like metaphorically. And so we could have now done some other things, popped the U, pushed something else, and now they don't match up on either end. Like, is that sure. The R could also equal S in this. If R equals S, you have P goes to R, 
R goes to S, R goes to R, and R goes to Q. So you would have A, P, Q goes to A, R, R, Z. A, R, R produces the empty string. So then it would just be A, Z. Yeah, yeah. But like uh, assuming that we had to apply A, P, Q goes to A, P, R, A, R, Q. Okay. We didn't. Like we had to uh, not introduce yes. two to do that at the beginning. And then the reason why we're forced to do that, like the reason why we even need that production in the first place is because eventually by repeatedly applying the latter one, it doesn't actually get us things. This is analogous to considering the grammar uh, S goes to A, S, B, or empty string. Consider that context-free grammar. You have a stopping condition is when you take this epsilon. That's equivalent to taking this epsilon as a stopping condition. But there is a quote-unquote production. It's not a production, but apply this production infinitely many times yeah. and never apply that production. That We only say a string is produced if it has no non-terminals. So although you can consider all possible working strings of this grammar, some of them, they will never terminate unless they hit the, this one case, yeah. this base case. And that's what's enforcing like the intuition behind the pictures in the grammar. It's like we start out that way, and then we basically like enforce it with every step. And if we do something like horribly wrong, or we don't do the thing that we want to do, then we'll just never, we'll reach a state where we, there's no way out to terminate. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Great questions. Yeah. More questions? Yes. Correct. Yeah. I erased it. But yes, A and, A and Z can be epsilon. More questions? Difficult proof. Hardest one in the class, I promise. Okay.